you have a Bible with you this morning, I invite you to open it up to start with to the book of 1 Corinthians and chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, three verses of scripture, if I could read them to you. Uh, one of them I went ahead and put in the bulletin. It's just a, such a powerful verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Drop down to verses 22 and 23. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews, a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Let's pray. Lord, may your word accomplish your will. May it be that once again we would hear from you and not from Daryl Quinn. Lord, for I know I'm not even worthy to stand here. But I thank you, God, you've given us a sure word, a word we can trust, a word we can build our lives on, a word that we can even die for. And I pray, God, that this morning in this place you would be honored, glorified, and praised because you're worthy. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The cross, the cross literally has through the years gone from being uh, the symbol of importance to being a mockery, the cross. Um, when we see the word cross in the Bible, and we note that it's been used 28 times in the King James Version, and the word crucified is used 37 times. So the, and these are all in the New Testament. Uh, so that this is dealt with a lot. It's not just a passing phrase or a, a come and a go, if you will. It's important, the cross. And you do understand Jesus was not the first to die on a cross, right? If you've got a Bible and you're willing to confirm this, in Matthew chapter 10 and uh, verse 38, Matthew uh, 10, 38, Jesus says, and he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Now, there and also in Matthew 20, 16, 24 is two places where Christ is referring to how that we are to carry our cross. We are to carry our cross. Well, now, he hasn't been to the cross yet when he said those things. He's teaching. And it's because the cross was already in use in some places in Rome and, and had been used earlier in other nations as a means of a punishment, a means of... Uh, uh, killing somebody uh, uh, who is uh, guilty of a crime worthy of death. And so it's already been in use, but, but Christ, even in his teachings, uh, as we see in those two verses of Scripture, uh, we see that he refers to the cross and how that we, you and I, who are followers of Jesus, we're to be willing to pick up our cross and carry it, whatever that cross may be. And I'm sure it's different... Uh, different problem from different folks. And although I think most folks can call their cross something that really has nothing to do with God, it's just a personal problem. But yet that, that's there. Now, you know the cross, uh, we're living in a time when we're just blowing up all our, our information we have so far as um, history is concerned. I, I like to watch the history programs. I mean, you know, I just do, I enjoy it. And uh, uh, it's called The Curse of Oak Island. Uh, I don't know if any of y'all watched that or not. I, I watched most of it, didn't get to see all of it, uh, didn't get to see the last episode or two, uh, but I personally enjoyed it. And did you notice when they found the gold cross on that program? And they were able to date that back to uh, hundreds of years before Christopher Columbus. Somebody's going to have to go rewrite that song. Uh, you know, he, he, saw, he sailed the ocean blue in 1492 or whatever that thing goes. I, I know it's backwards or something. But um, unfortunately, Christopher Columbus was not the one who discovered America. It had already been found by others. And, and a, a cross literally was one of the pieces of evidence that was discovered on Oak Island, uh, which is a part of Canada. And uh, they found it there and were able to prove that it came from a time way back before Christopher Columbus's day. And um, interesting study, but I'm saying that because the cross has been around. The cross is, has been at times the item that folks wanted to recognize. It, it is the most recognizable Christian uh, symbol there is, period. That's not debatable. The cross is the representation of the Christian faith. 
unfortunately, today in this world we're living in, there's a whole lot of folks that claim to be Christians and ain't got nothing to do with the cross and they don't want anything to do with the cross. And they'll tell you that. It, it's, it's barbaric. It's uh, inhumane. It's, uh, it's negative. It's sad. It's bad. They don't want nothing to do with it. Unfortunately, they're going to probably bust hell wide open because if you don't go by the way of the cross, you don't make it. And that's just the way it is. I'm sorry. But we're living in a time when the cross has gone up and down and it's seen its elevation to the point of where everybody wanted to wear one in their ear or around their neck or, or have it someplace where they look at it over the kitchen table, you know, somewhere you're going to have a cross to the point where we're coming to a time in America when so many folks are wanting to throw it away. Even I uh, read about a school, uh, that, a college that had been started as a Christian institution for training ministers and uh, just a few years ago, they decided that uh, they didn't want to exclude anybody. They didn't want to offend anybody. I'm sorry, the cross is offensive, always has been, always will be. Don't try to follow Christ unless you're willing to realize the cross is offensive. It says to everybody that's out there, you're a sinner, and it's on that cross your blood, the blood of Christ was able to wash your sins away. That's the teaching of it. So we, it's offensive. Well, this uh, college, y'all read about that? It's been a few years ago. College said, well, we don't want this anymore. So they had some of the uh, leaders of the college go in there and take the cross off the wall of the chapel, church. They took the cross off the wall and put it in a closet so it wouldn't offend anybody. Thank goodness one of the supporters of the college in a big way financially wrote them a letter and told them, said, if you don't put that cross back up, you'll get no more money from me. Hallelujah. Somebody had enough nerve to stand up and tell folks what, what is what. Right is right, wrong is wrong, and the truth is the cross is not debatable for Christianity. It's not. It's not. Uh, Christ was not the first to bear it. The Old Testament does not actually use the word cross or crucified. Uh, those two words are not actually in the Old Testament. But some absolutely clear teachings that point to the cross are there. To me, uh, I have trouble, and I'll be honest with you, I have trouble with what some professors say is uh, uh, evidences of the Old Testament, the predictions that point to Christ and, and all. And I'm, I'm being honest, there's some guys out there smarter than me, I guess. But in Genesis 22, and that's way back here, Genesis chapter 22, whenever Abraham and Isaac went to that mountain out there, three days journey, they traveled three days to get there with a couple of servants and some donkeys, and they got out there, and whenever Isaac put on his son, uh, whenever Abraham put on his son Isaac the wood for the fire, there is no doubt that you read that and study it, you've got God the Father, God the Son, and there was the cross on the boy's back, the wood, and he carried up that hill that made the altar that his daddy Abraham laid him on in order to sacrifice him. He didn't do it because God stopped him, but he was there to do it. A obvious, clear point toward the cross of Christ. Genesis, I mean, 22 is where that's at. But in Psalms chapter 22, it's one of the most vivid descriptions of what happened on the cross that you'll ever read. Just go simply read Psalms 22. And it talks about some of the very words that Christ said from my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Right on down to talking about the demons that were oppressing him and the, the fact of his body was drying up and, he, and his tongue was cleaving to his mouth. And on and on it goes and just vividly describing what happened on the cross. So even though the word cross is not used in the Old Testament, it is clearly, plainly pointed to and spoken about, and the teachings are there. The cross, the cross. In the New Testament, when you come to the crucifixion and you realize the crowd that's gathered there, and um, you know that, that old song, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord?, uh, when you stop and study the Bible and you study those folks who were there uh, that were at the cross the day Christ was crucified, even among those, uh, there's a, a verse of Scripture in the New Testament that refers to the sightseers uh, who were gathered there just to see the sight, what was going to happen. You know how we are. Uh, if an ambulance gets called out someplace, if a fire starts up, or, you know, we want to see the sight. We want to see what's going on. And, and they were there the day of the crucifixion. And the Bible says those sightseers came by the cross where Christ was hanging and mocked him, made fun of him, and even said, if you are really who you say you are, if you can save others, come down from that cross. And, uh, and they had the nerve to mock him like that. But it wasn't but just a very, I think the next verse or two is where uh, the, 
the high priest and the, or those that were the, the chief leaders in the religious day, they came by the cross and they said basically the same thing. They wound up saying, you saved others, save yourself. Come down off that cross. And you'll find out in just another verse or two, and this is all in, in Matthew 27, 39 through 44, there's a third time. And this time it's the thief that's hanging on the cross next to him who cries out and mockingly uh, says things to Jesus and then said, if you are the Christ, then save yourself and save us. And so three times the enemies of Christ tried to talk him into coming off the cross. I don't know, I've heard, some, I've heard a preacher preach a good sermon, a really enjoyable message uh, study-wise about how that uh, Satan didn't want Jesus to go to the cross. And I've heard some preach some real good ones that Satan put him there. You know, I, I don't know. We get to heaven, we'll find out. And there's debatable uh, sides there. It really are. But um, the one that says that the devil didn't want Jesus to die on the cross, it may be that he was instigating uh, the sightseers that day, or he was instigating the chief priests and all of them, or he was instigating that thief next door to say, come down, come down, come down, don't die up here. You see, Christ had to die on the cross. I, I, I've always enjoyed listening to Mark Lowry singing and his storytelling. He can tell some pretty good ones. The one I've heard him tell, and I'm, if you've listened to him very much, you had to hear him tell it, was uh, when they, he was a child and he and his brother went with their mother to the movie theaters and saw the Ten Commandments, and Cecil B. DeMille's way back there and, and all that. And so they were sitting there watching that movie and, and they got to the point in the movie where they were about to crucify Jesus. And, and little Mark Lowry was just a little boy uh, up in his seat. You know how kids used to do when, when we were smaller. You put your knees up in the seat where you could see over the head in front of you. And he's sitting there in that seat and they're about to crucify Jesus. And Mark jumps up and screams out, no, 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 they're going to kill him. They're going to kill him. And Mark's brother grabs him and pulls him back down in the seat and says, shut up or we all go to hell. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, wait, cruise, the cross, the cross. Wait a minute, please hear me. I know the society we're living in. I know the trains of thought that's out there. I was driving, going somewhere the other day a week or two ago, and, and after about an hour and a half of riding, I realized I was listening to a Christian radio station, and not one song, not one word had said cross. Now, I realize there's lots of great songs that do not, are not focused in on the cross. Lots of great ones. But I thought it rather strange this season of the year, going up to what we're coming up to this week, that for over an hour of listening to Christian music, that the cross was not mentioned. But then again, I don't know the folks that run this radio station or the folks who are emceeing it or whatever. They, they may be like some others that I have met. And who would openly, pointedly tell you that we don't need to preach about the cross. We don't need to teach about the cross. That's, that's all negative. That's all sad. That's all bad. Let's leave that all alone. I, 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 can't agree, I cannot agree with them. I will not agree with them because the Word of God does not agree with them. As we just read here in Paul's writing to the Corinthians there, it said, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Now, now wait a minute. I know it's, it's not a pleasant story. And if you take the time to study it right and proper, it is gory. And, 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 and it, the, the movie, The Passion, really, that really wasn't good enough. It was, it was very vivid. It was very, very gruesome. But the truth is, if you and I had been there on the day that Christ was crucified, and if we had seen with our own eyes and heard with our ears that which was going on on that hill, the movie, The Passion, didn't touch it. Not really. The, that which goes on the screen never really vividly, pointedly shows real life, real life. Christ went to the cross, and that is where he died for you and me. He died for us. But, well, well, why, why did God choose a cross? I mean, I'm serious. I've asked myself that question a lot, and obviously I ain't smart enough to give a good answer. Why would God in his, in his great almighty omnipotence, why would he choose that Christ had to go to a cross? It should have been some other way, something else that could be done. I'm in pretty good company. Jesus in the garden. 
before the crucifixion. You remember what he said? Jesus said, Father, if there be any other way, don't make me drink this bitter cup. Jesus knew what he was facing. Jesus knew what was just out there beyond him that next morning or into the daylight hours. Jesus knew. And he didn't want to have to go through it. He knew it was going to be bad. But then he finished his prayer by saying, Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Oh, man. Lord, have mercy on us. And we belly ache, gripe, and complain about the least little problems that jump up or slap us around a little bit. We want everything to go real smooth and be hunky-dory and happy and we all love each other and act like we love each other and everything goes fine and dandy. I'm sorry, friend. You ain't read the book. It's not there. Not that kind of life on this earth. I'm, it's not. And we're not to expect it. And I am saddened when I realize the number of preachers that are out here in the world today and teachers who will go through life and they'll preach and they'll teach all about the love of God and the mercy of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. But then they want to make you believe that you can have it fine and dandy and everybody will love you and you can love everybody and everything's going to get along just fine. I'm sorry, what book are they reading? They killed Jesus. They crucified Peter. They stoned Stephen. They cut John the Baptist's head off. Who in the world do you think you are that you can get through this world and get along fine with everybody? When the greatest leaders we had to start the work of the church of God all got killed for what they believed in. Oh, no, we're going we're gonna to be different now. We're going to love each other. We're going to be kind. The cross. God chose the cross. You got your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. I think that maybe we can see some things here that we need to see. Hebrews chapter 9, beginning with verse 11. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, the good things are to come, out in glory, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. It says serve him, not just think about him. And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. In other words, the, the testament, the will, is not in place until the person dies. Then it takes a, effect. Verse 17 for a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. In other words, the first testament, the Old Testament, and the teachings of Moses and all that he, he went through in trying to lead the people of Israel right and proper. He even himself knew blood had to be used, as it says there for verse 19. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people. You know, is your mind doing what it's made to do? I mean, really. You got a picture up there? Are you seeing in your brain what these words just said? Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the book, the law, and on the people. The blood. The blood. Yeah. Oh, well... 
Verse 22, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. Now, in other words, verse 22 is, if you take it and put it right down in South Georgia term, unless the blood is shed, there will be no forgiveness for sins. Now, that, that's, that's the South Georgia terminology. That's the way it is. Verse 23, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves were the better sacrifice than these, for Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Hallelujah. You want to have a lawyer on your behalf? You want somebody to defend you before the judge that's able to defend good? It's Jesus Christ is the one there now to defend us. And whenever we mess up, and oh, we do, and whenever we do, Jesus Christ is the one there next to God the Father who's ready to intercede for you and me and let God the Father know we're his, we're a part of him and his family. That's good, that's good. Verse 25, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters into the holy place every year with blood of others. In other words, he said, Jesus doesn't have to do this regularly, often. He doesn't have to go there again. Verse 26, for then must he often have suffered since the foundations of the world. But now, once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Once. Once, he has done it. It's already been done. And the veil between uh, common folk and the Holy of Holies has been ripped from the top down. And we who are common folk have the privilege under God Almighty to go and carry our burdens to the Lord himself. Once, he had done this. Verse 27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ has been there once, once. Verse 28, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Christ shed his blood. So Daryl Quinn's sins could be washed away. Jesus did it. He ain't going to do it again. No, he's not. Therefore, I cannot lose my salvation because if I lost it, it'd be over. There'd be no hope of getting saved again. None. It's over. But because the blood of Christ is an everlasting covenant, hallelujah, everlasting, I'm a sinner, I mess up, oh, and you do too. We mess up, but here's the good news. God already knows that, and years ago on Calvary's cross, he who knew no sin took every sin that we confess and ask for forgiveness of when we ask him to forgive us. He takes all those sins to Calvary. I got a, y'all know, I, I use a Thompson Chain Reference Bible. It's my study Bible of choice. And in the back of it, there's a page that is dedicated to the day of the crucifixion. And it's got a, a cross, but it's built up around a clock. And, and it shows from the uh, the what would be the 6 a.m. from then to 9 a.m. And at 9 a.m. is when Christ was crucified. And then from 9 a.m. to noon and the things that were said by Jesus and the others that were there. And then at 12 noon, uh, the comments that were made. And then the darkness comes and it stays dark from 12 to 3, after, 3 in the afternoon. And during that time is when Christ, who knew no sin, became sin. And God the Father, who could not be in the presence of sin, turned his back on his own son and looked the other way or went the other way. And Jesus, the Holy Savior, the sinless Savior, he bore our sins alone on Calvary's cross and his own father had to leave him alone. And Jesus took every dirty, rotten thing you've ever done and everything I've ever done that was wrong. And he bore them on him. The cross. The cross. Oh, man. <sighs> he was once offered to bear our sins. The cross. What can wash away your sins, friend? Don't y'all wish I could sing? I'd take off singing. 
What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood. I, I'm going to give you a challenge. Do you a little bit of research. I don't care if you Google it or you get you a good hymn book and look it up. You go back and look up all these great songs. Some of them we sang this morning talking about the cross and the blood and these things. And it might amaze you that some of the songs we sing today, some of them were, were very popular that, that we sing that are modern, new, new writers, amen, hallelujah. But it's a lot of them, if you check them out, it was in the early 1900s, like the 1915, that some of the most popular songs about the cross were written. And if you go beyond that, you'll find out it was about 1860 or 1865 that some of those precious songs were. And you check it out and you get back and it's in 1700, 1707, 1711. Some of these special songs that tell the absolute truth about the cross and they talk about the doctrine that you cannot avoid if you want to go to heaven. Those songs were written hundreds and hundreds of years ago. We still sing them today. And I'm glad Jonathan's willing to lead us in songs like that and help us sing praises to our Savior and sing the doctrines of our faith. Yeah. But do you understand now we're in the time when people are wanting to take that which has been an obvious truth for hundreds and hundreds of years and they want to do away with it. They want to change it. Times are better now. That's what we talked about last Sunday morning. You were here and we talked about being relevant. The people around us today in this world that tell, oh, well, you know, that church, it ain't relevant. That church really doesn't touch lives today. Yeah, you folks at the church down there where you preach one of them old Bibles, you know, you, you, you need to get you a new translation with some new upgraded uh, and updated phrases in it. Uh, yeah, yeah. And let the world go to hell because if you don't go by the way of the cross, you will not make it. If you're in this room this morning and you've never come to Jesus and acknowledging that his death on the cross, his shed blood is the way you can have forgiveness of your sins. If you've never been willing to acknowledge that, friend, you're lost. You're lost. You've got to come to Christ. You've got to come his way. Your plan won't work. My plan won't work. You either go his way or you don't make it. And I know where we're living. I know what's happening around us. And unfortunately, it breaks my heart to think about where's our, our children going to be in 10 or 15 years? What, who are they going to be listening to? The disgusting feelings I had in my heart the day I sat in a vehicle and listened to two older preachers than me discuss their college and their seminary days and talking about how they had a seminary professor at one of our Southern Baptist schools who stood up every semester that they started the class and he openly told the whole class, I just want y'all to know right off the bat, I don't believe in the virgin birth. I just, I just don't believe it. I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe in the virgin birth. I'm going to be honest with you. That man is going to bust in hell. If Christ is not born of a virgin and lived a sinless life and died on Calvary's cross, then he's not God's son. And he claimed to be God's son. He said he was. He's God. Have you come to him? Have you done it his way? That's your only hope. It's your only hope. If you're in this room this morning and you'd be honest, you'd say, well, look, I've never never been willing to walk the aisle and, you know, let other folks know I'm a sinner. I don't don't really want to do that. I'm kind of embarrassed. Well, I'm sorry. If you're not willing to let other folks know that you're a sinner, I hate to tell you that. Everybody knows it already. I don't care who you are. We're all sinners. But by coming to Jesus Christ and asking him to forgive us of our sins, to save us, he can. He's God. He can take a dirty, rotten sinner filled with all the evil, selfish, lustful thoughts and ambitions that we of the world have, and he can take all that and wash it away. Ain't that good? Hallelujah. He can even... He can, if we're willing to follow him, I mean, getting saved is one thing, but then living for Christ is a whole other ball game, and it's tough. It's tough. God doesn't say it'll be easy. You don't have to, Jesus said it. We looked at them two verses in Matthew. Take up your cross and follow Christ, and the cross may have something to do with you and your self-sacrifice concerning your personal desires and lust and, and all that kind of stuff. But if we're willing to follow Christ, I got good news for you. Jesus is able to empower you, he and me, 
that we can say no to the temptations of lust and selfishness of this world and we can follow Jesus. It's your choice. It's your choice. Don't tell me you can't do it. I already know you can't do it. But he who is in you, if you're saved, he can. He can. Where are you, friend? Have you settled the issue? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? That's what you need. That's what the cross is all about. So that we could come to God. And that blood shed on Calvary's cross to wash all our filth away. So when God the Father looks at Daryl Quinn, he doesn't see old sorry Daryl Quinn. He sees a cleaned up, hey, sanctified, glorified, born again follower of Jesus. Are you one? Are you one? I hope so. Well, I trust you realize if you're not, you're just a heartbeat away from eternity. Possibly in a lake of fire. Your call, your choice. Say yes to Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, there's all kinds of needs in this room and I know it. And once again, God, I confess and acknowledge I'm not worthy nor able to provide for any of these folks the sweet salvation that's needed but I thank you because of your shed blood on Calvary's cross and because of what you did back then and how you defeated the devil, the grave, death itself. The Lord, you give to us that victory. And I'm praying, God, that we in this room will make sure of our relationship with you, that we have asked you to forgive us for our sins and be our Savior, and that, Lord, we would seek to walk with you and for you, that others would see Jesus in us. Bless us to that end. For it's in Christ's name I pray.